Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this new episode of the H8 series. My name is Aline, and I'm the Chief International Officer of Barcelona Hub. The DHH series are online events that we've been organizing from Barcelona Hub Hub since March last year around topics related to digital health. So for and with the members of Barcelona Health Hub and other experts and guests from around the world. So today's episode number 20, and we had a, a total of uh, more than 12,000 viewers along those episodes. So we're very happy with that. So today we're going to talk about augmented and virtual reality and the applications and opportunities in the healthcare sector. So if you remember, about nine years ago, uh, the Google Glasses appeared. So, and there were a, a revolution at the time, like everybody was talking about them and taking pictures with them. And um, But things have evolved a lot in nine years, like uh, different types of glasses appeared, applications evolved. So in the, in the panel discussion today, um, we will discuss how AR and VR are improving the patient experience, empowering healthcare professionals, and strengthening the relationship between the patient and the healthcare professionals. Um, and today, I'm very excited because we're experiencing something new. Um, so this is the first part of the event and the second part. So right after that event at 8.15, we will continue that discussion on Clubhouse. So I don't know if you've heard of Clubhouse. Everybody's talking about it at the moment. So it will be 8.15 p.m. CET on Clubhouse. And so you need to have an iPhone and be on Clubhouse to join. So we'll put the link now in the chat so you, you can join. So let me introduce uh, the, the speakers that will uh, accompany me today. So first we have um, Mireya Sigaran, CEO and co-founder of VR Pharma. Dr. Teresa Franco Castan, medical staff in the mm -hmm. anesthesiology and ICU department of Hospital University of German Stresi Pujol. Dr. Jose Ibeas, senior consultant in nephrology from Park Tauli Hospital Universitari. And Dr. Rafael Grossman, general trauma and laparoscopic surgeon, educator, and digital health innovator. And Rafael was also the first surgeon to operate with Google Glasses. So we'll talk about that a bit more, a bit more details. So before we start uh, diving into the topic of the speakers, I would like to do a short introduction about ARVR. There. Can I have the, the slides, please? Okay, so first application will be medical education. So those applications, uh, those solutions can really be used to train healthcare professionals. So example of sim for health for instance. So where you, you're in a virtual setting and you can, you can train, you will be the patient, you will put the IV to the patient, see how it works. Then we've got a solution like CAE that help to plan and prepare surgeries. Uh, so you can really like, see the different parts of the body, get them out. Uh, you can see them with the glasses to understand how you will operate, where you should operate, if there's a tumor, how should you go, etc. Then it, it can be used to broadcast operation. So that's why AIS surgery are doing. Uh, so you've got like top, top surgeons operating and they, they can be followed by other surgeons around the world. So that's really help them to learn from the best. Next slide. Another application would be uh, what I call augmented medicine. So how it can really help the healthcare professionals in their job. So first will be um, visual, visualizing data with like the Athea Labs glasses. So imagine that you, you're in a room seeing a patient and at the, the tip of a finger, you can just see all the information about the patient in front of you. You can see the patient file, the vitals in real time, and that really helps you to make like a better decision on, on the patient. Another example, maybe more for, for nurses, with this AccuVein solution that helps to, to see the vein. Um, that would, would have been very useful for during Ebola time, for instance, when they, they needed to put some IV to the patients to hydrate them. Uh, but it was difficult sometimes to, to, to see the vein or, or some nurses or the people are not trained for that. Other application would be what I call remote visit. So imagine like the first image, the, the lady in white will be a nurse. She's wearing the glasses and the doctor would be at home in his house. And he would see what that nurse is seeing through the glasses. And he can just like guard her through the, with the patient asking the questions. So it means that the doctor can be at home seeing different patients from different hospitals, maybe across the world without moving. So that would be like a, 
a great thing. And then another application will be companies like MedSite Tech, who are a novel extra technology helping to, to see like, the size of a tumor when a, a surgeon is operating. Next one would be uh, patient care. So how ARVR is improving patient care. So firstly, for rehabilitation. So we have the example of the Sheba Hospital, which is the Israeli hospital, the first fully VR-based hospital. So they, they implemented VR-based solution all across the hospital. And here you've got the example of the rehabilitation room. ARVR can also be uh, used for to treat phobias and addiction. So you've got the example of Psyus, a, a company from Barcelona Health Hub. And in that example, they are treating the patient uh, with fear of light. Um, ARVR can also help to be more active. So a great example is Pokemon Go, so most of you know. Um, so there were some studies that um, proved that Pokemon Go, that there are solutions where you, you're catching um, Pokemon and Pikachus, was were actually helping people to move. They were moving much more during exercise and they were also being more social. So a great positive effect. Another example would be a company from Australia called Small World that are helping a mother, new mother who's breastfeeding. So here you see the mom, she's breastfeeding the baby, she's wearing the Google glasses. There's a nurse or healthcare professional on the other side, like watching through the glasses, the baby. And if there's an issue, if the baby doesn't want to drink, well, they can guide the mom uh, to, so the baby can, uh, can breastfeed properly. And lastly, other application that we're going to talk more in the session today is patient experience. So we say patients are more than in disease and, and ARVR really helping to rehumanize healthcare more. So one way would be with education and stress relief or surgery preparation. So example would be Exploro. Um, so that's AR solution, like a small avatar for, for the kids, was developed for kids uh, in the oncology department to explain them what is happening. Then ARVR can also help, especially VR, to take patients outside the hospital. So imagine patients were in the hospital for a month and they can't, can't get out because of the treatments or other reasons. Well, that can help them to travel a bit. You know, maybe they can go on the beach or they can go somewhere else. Uh, so that's a great benefit. It is also used for pain reduction. So that's what Ibno VR are doing. I will talk more about that in, in the session today. And finally, another example will be for kids with special needs like autism or ADHD, like the example of uh, brain power. So now uh, that we saw a, a bit of an example of the different applications of ARVR, um, I would let uh, our experts today introduce themselves so they can tell us who they are and how they're using ARVR in their day, day to day. We're going to start with uh, Teresa, please. Welcome. Yes. Welcome, everybody. Okay, let's put the video on as I've done with it. Okay. Se estima que en el año 2019 se operarán aproximadamente un total de 90.000 niños en Cataluña. De estos 90.000 niños, Según los estudios que se han realizado durante muchos años, un 50% de ellos van a sufrir ansiedad preoperatoria. Me llamo Tomás López y soy el impulsor del proyecto Nixie for Children. Es una experiencia de realidad virtual para ayudar a los niños y a las niñas que tienen que operarse a prepararse antes de la operación. Hola, soy la doctora Franco, soy anestesióloga pediátrica en el Hospital Germán Estrías de Pujol y estoy súper especializada en el área pediátrica. Cuando Tomás nos presentó el proyecto, rápidamente nos pusimos a trabajar para diseñar un estudio que demostrara que la realidad virtual va a ser una herramienta muy útil para el tratamiento de la ansiedad preoperatoria. Diseñamos un kit que los niños y las niñas se pueden llevar a casa para compartirlo con sus familias. Dentro del kit pueden encontrar un librito de actividades que complementa la realidad virtual y permite a los padres descubrir las ansiedades de cada niño. Esta información se puede transmitir a los médicos que luego personalizarán mejor sus tratamientos para cada niño. Dentro de la realidad virtual se encontrarán con Nix. Es el personaje 3D que hemos creado para ayudarles a familiarizarse con el protocolo por el que pasarán el día de su operación.
La experiencia ya está lista, ahora solo tiene que llegar a los pacientes que la necesitan. Con cada donación podemos ayudar a que un niño, una niña y su familia mejoren su experiencia en el hospital. Únete a nosotros para combatir la ansiedad preoperatoria. Ok, so you have seen already my presentation. So I'm Teresa Franco, I'm anesthesiologist of Hospital German Sries y Pujol, and I take part in a group of anesthesiologists uh, super specialized in pediatrics. Uh, this is a group that is uh, one of our biggest concerns is the preoperative anxiety. And why is that? It's not only because we want to work in a very nice and peaceful place, it's because the preoperative anxiety has a really worse consequences if they are not treated before the starting of the procedure. So, uh, we all of the group have been looking for something, we didn't know what, something, a tool that really helped us to treat, to treat the preoperative anxiety. And the perfect tool is a tool that has to give the information uh, specific with the language proper for each kid depend according to the mental development it's not the same to treat a patient about around four than another one a teenager absolutely different so we started the project uh, treating children among, uh, between four and 12 years old then you need the proper information you need uh, to hand it over uh, among 24 hours and one week before the surgery and uh, it has to be a tool easy to apply and that has to be useful not only for the kid even for the family because we have to work with them as a whole so by random we met Thomas a young entrepreneur that shows us this fantastic tool is Nix. Nix is a 3d character that shows the whole procedure uh, all the kids and the family and it shows in a way uh, very special is a virtual reality so the kids and the families can see just from the beginning just at the end of the procedure where the kid is going to be so what is important why is that so important because then the kid is able to start to control their environment we are giving him or her the information to be, to give him more resources to cope with these unknown situations. So that is empowering not only the kid, even the family. They can share the formation, then they can talk about them. Then in this way, they treat the preoperative anxiety. So if they, they go to hospital with a low level of anxiety, then they will cooperate during the induction of the anesthesia, because it's the highest moment, the worst for the kids, the most anxious moment for the, of the whole procedure. Then after the surgery, they, they will, if they know everything what's gonna happen, they don't need uh, as much painkillers as other kids, then we suffer much less the, what we call uh, the post-anesthetic emergence delirium is a change on the behavior just put in the post immediate post-surgery that sometimes it needs to be treated with drugs. and we can avoid as well the changes in the behavior that could happen uh, it could be compared as a post-trauma situation so in the whole the tool that we have now is a virtual reality virtual reality that help us never replace uh, i like to point that because i think doctors have to still still we have something to do with the patients we only need tools that help us to deal with the patient, to make it all the procedure easier, to give him the resources to cope it, them so that they can avoid all these side effects, bad side effects of the, the surgery. Um, I don't know if I'm out of time, but yes, I hope I can summarize what the project is going on. And we did, uh, we just uh, set it up, uh, I don't know, maybe because, because of the COVID, I don't remember, probably two years ago, more or less. And um, we tested, so we, we introduced the project through a survey and the results are really good because we compare, uh, we did uh, 
randomized controlled trial etc etc and the results are still not printed out because the COVID-19 <laughs> ran out of me out of time but it's going to be soon probably I hope uh, or not I don't know well um, and the results are for us are really really good so really the kids that had used the virtual reality they have level of uh, anxiety that we in a scale that we use in its low, lower levels of anxiety in the preoperative so that they avoid the negative consequences of the high anxiety in the preoperative. Is it more or less clear? Yes, Hello. thank you very much. Okay. 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 Yeah, we will talk about it more like later in the, in the discussion anyway. Thank you for the for the project. So now okay. was, was like She's more active in like pre operation like at, at, at the house. And now we're gonna talk, uh, like, uh, Mireya will explain us what she does, and she's more inside the hospital. Mireya, all yours. Thank you. Um, can we well, if you want, we can start with a video. Well, um, thank you, first of all, to well, count on us for this series. It's a pleasure for us to be here with all these experts and share our knowledge and our experiences with all of you. Um, well, uh, I am Mireya, founder of Beer Pharma, and I would like to introduce you a little bit what we do. Um, we are a startup with a mission to enhance patients' experience before, um, during, and after medical treatments. Our main target is to increase their emotional well-being while reducing their anxiety, fear, um, pain, pain perception when they are most vulnerable. We want to bring to the healthcare system a scalable, cost-effective tool to help the right patient at the right moment. This is why we are working on a unique software to bring an easy-to-use virtual reality solution. Our system is actually designed for hospital usage it is hygienic, it is portable and fast. Actually, in only a little, a few seconds, we have the, the patient under the, the BR experience. And well, to design this system, we counted on many different inputs of doctors, nurses, and patients to understand the needs. Also, we want to reach as many patients in need as possible. And well, that's why we designed a companion app so that the patient doesn't need to learn how to use BR or anything at all. The healthcare professional simply put, uh, puts the headset to the patient and in one click, the patient is, is already in the BR environment. Also um, with the tablet, the medical staff can overview the experience and control it, allowing the patient to simply immerse himself and enjoy. Now we are running different pilots and clinical trials in top hospitals in Spain that are proving to be very promising. In one, for instance, we are using one of our conscious uh, breathing experiences to reduce medical staff stress. Another example is a trial that we are running to reduce pain perception during the insertion of intravenous roots or IV roots in children right before surgery. So that's a little bit what I wanted to, to tell about VR Pharma. Um, this is our mission, this is what we're doing, and well, thank you for this introduction, Aline. Thank you very much, Mireya. Now we're gonna talk about medical education with Jose. 
Can you tell us more like what you're doing, what you were doing just now before joining the session? Well, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I'm Jose Veas, I'm a neurologist, and I work in the world of kidney diseases, dialysis, transplant, and so on. And we have to do a lot of invasive procedures, surgical procedures, endovascular procedures with high risk for the patients. And the question, for example, is if any of us have to go to the emergency room and suddenly you see the uh, resident of the first year in the first day of working in the hospital, and he's very happy of have his first patient, just like you. He's very happy because he's going to put the first catheter in the neck to the patient, like you. And the simulation model is you. And he's going to be training with you with the help of the senior consultants you are close to him, but the hands are of this training. So you would be feel that you are safe? Sure, probably, because you are with a consultant, senior consultant, but in the hands of the trainee. So the question, our uh, first, our main concern is that in the training should not be done with human beings, should be done with simulation models. In this context, in the world dialysis we created, and we have cre we are creating a spin-off, it's called an medical in order to work with simulation models. And with the pandemic, we have jumped to the real virtuality in order to train people a long distance and with the main concern related with the synthetic simulators but with, with, with virtual reality. It's a completely different world. This is just the introduction in order to present the presentation. Go ahead, please. Good evening. I'm Jose Beas. I'm in Flores. I work in Partory University Hospital. Uh, I, will, I would like to share our experience in the technology the virtual reality. I'm in Flores. I work in the world of kidney diseases. For clean the world, we need dialysis, but for, but for to get the best adequacy, the best dialysis, we need to clean the blood using vascular access that get the blood to the machines. For this, we need to do surgical procedures, we need to do endovascular procedures, training. For in order to get the best training, we create an ice medical that is um, a product that uses realistic images from CT scans of an MRIs in order to create the same structures in the human beings in simulators. It's use virtual solutions, augmented reality or virtual reality. Some examples use it in our courses. In fact, we have just now today our courses regarding this or in national courses. Here you can see the vessels in the arm. We have created a fistula that this is a huge vein to make the needle in dialysis. In order to train the people, we need these models in order to explain them how are these structures. Or for instance, this in the neck, you will have to put catheters that are important tubes in the jugular vein that can be dangerous because the carotid artery is just close to the jugular vein. We need to explain our students how should be the best approach, like here. You can see the fingers in the D, 3D models. And this is more important for us because if they have to understand how it works, the three the best way to understand this is to introduce the teacher inside the models in order that the students see by the eyes of the teacher how it works this world. This is really amazing. And this, is, this is the translation of all the useful simulation models in tissue to virtual reality. I would will, I will like that you enjoy this kind of new world that approaches. Thank you very much indeed. Well, then, in summary, the idea is use virtual reality for training. Then, in the one hand, we have the synthetic models for training in order to make the best approach with your hands, in order to train with the synthetic model. And the other point of view is to understand what you're doing with your hands. And the virtual reality is another amazing world. Kidney diseases is characterized because we have to use solica procedures. We have to, you need, we need solica procedures from the surgeons. We need endovascular procedures from the radiologists, the vascular radiologists, or interventional nephrologists. We need to do kidney biopsies. We need to do a lot of procedures that depends of training. And for this reason, the complementary aims of the virtual reality and the synthetic models create the perfect stone to the training, the trainee before the first time that the hands of the trainee touch the patient. That's the, all the, the main concepts to bear in your mind before to make the discussion afterwards. And, and now I would like to introduce uh, Rafael. Rafael is an honor to have you here today. So Rafael is really a pioneer 
an expert in that field, so I would let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Alina, and, and uh, to my colleagues. Uh, it's glad to be here. And um, anyways, I'm a general surgeon uh, uh, and a trauma surgeon. Uh, I'm full-time clinical, and uh, over the years, I've uh, tried to uh, uh, explore the convergence of uh, technology and, and healthcare and education. And uh, it happens that over the last few years, like Aline said, uh, the technology has really blown up uh, exponentially. Uh, uh, as uh, being a, a surgeon uh, in the trenches and finding how difficult it is to do healthcare, how difficult it is to learn and to teach uh, medicine, uh, I thought of uh, uh, ways to uh, uh, use the technology in a, in, a, in, a, in a smart way or in a wise way in order to uh, connect uh, uh, us better and uh, to to help us communicate better and not just us humans to humans but also connect us to the digital world out there over the few years a 10 last years or so we've seen incredible advancement from something like like the google glass that alina talked to you about you know i did the first operation a live operation with google glass and all i did was just to put the glasses on and then connect my students uh, who were situated remotely, connect them to the operation I was doing so that I could show them from my perspective uh, and talk to them at the same time in a live, secure, and uh, a, 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 a consented a session. A, 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 so instead of them looking behind my back, they could see what I was doing. So that took a lot of uh, excitement and interest uh, by by the whole world and got me into this career, which now I feel uh, is a parallel career and uh, it's a responsibility to be a sort of a preacher and advocate and evangelist of how we can use technology in a smart way in order to improve the whole experience in healthcare from patients to relatives to students to experts i think that we have all the tools and now with immersive technologies like vr ar mr i think the potential is is really infinite if we um, see devices you know like the google cardboard right which is still valid and that is something that it, it really uh, help us a, 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 a bring that experience, that learning to be more immersive and more experiential to devices like the, the View 6 Blade. So we've been, so this is a, the Blade is, is, is a smart glass connected to the internet with the potential to bring a digital world on top of the physical world. So we've been using that, I've been using that mostly with students and patients to tell them and to show them what the operation, for example, is going to be like, to show them how the steps of the operation are. So that they give a better informed consent about the operation, as well as a learning, a, a teaching the students how to do a step-by-step -step operation. To uh, like a, a, our colleague said, a, for example, how to put a central line, or how to do a cricothyroidotomy, how to do a chest tube insertion, and from there some basic procedures to any complex procedure. And uh, technology has evolved, right? To what we have now, technologies like the Pico device that allows us to even do telemedicine in virtual reality and you can have a provider at a distance a, see your physical movements, for example, and improve how you do physical therapy or physiatry. A, all those things are just a, this day a, a exploding. <laughs> if we come to XR devices like the Magic Leap, right, you can see through. So you have actually a, a digital reality on top and also interactive with the real reality. And you can bring a, a not just an incredible educational material, but even diagnostic material and even therapeutic material. You have devices like the HoloLens, which along with the Magic Leap, really allow you to be protected during surgery. But this is just beginning. There's no one really doing surgery with these devices in a routine basis yet. We are using it mostly for education and for diagnostics. Now you have the partnership between Magic Leap and Brain Lab, which is really bringing the mixed reality viewer, where you can use all this incredible diagnostic imaging in 3D, almost a holographic fashion, with any axis approach, where you can use them 
actually within the actual surgical procedure. So the potential is really infinite. And uh, I see my role as a, as a, as a full-time surgeon and as a communicator and as an educator to, uh, to, to have this responsibility to bring that message out. And uh, the message is that we need to use technologies in a smart way in order to improve how we connect and who we communicate, but also to help us enhance that humanity of the doctor-patient relationship. I think that these devices, if used in a smart fashion, bringing, for example, the electronic medical record to what it should be, these devices are going to help us have a more empathetic experience, a more compassionate experience, and paradoxically, the technology is going to help us have a more humane medicine. So it's a great uh, time to be here. Fantastic, Rafael, thank you so much. You know, that's something I miss from the, the physical conferences. You doing your keynotes with your small suitcase and taking all the devices out of it. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Like, I'm glad <laughs> that everybody that. So yeah, thank you, thank you all for the questions. Um, I would like to start by, by, uh, by discussing with you like so you've got different projects and different different steps within the hospital healthcare system. Why did you choose VR, like virtual reality or, or augmented reality, over another te technology? What are the benefits of such technology? Rafael, you touched on it a, a, a bit. Like, um, Teresa, maybe do you want to start? Yes, if you want. Yes. Well, I choose virtual reality uh, absolutely by chance because, as I told you before, uh, we were looking for a tool and we didn't know exactly which kind of tool would would really help us. And we randomly met uh, Thomas and he introduces us to the virtual reality. And we thought that it, that could be great uh, to help kids. Why? Because virtual, uh, children nowadays, they are born in a technological area that I wasn't born, so I need to get used, but they are absolutely uh, familiar to these technologies, so it's really easy to use for them. And um, because um, at the time you give them the cardboard, you don't need any explanation. They use it without any explanation. That's really that's something that shocked me because I need these explanations, but they don't. They mm. usually teach parents and grandparents how to use. And because we are using that as the way to know uh, the real area where they are going to be. Not, it's not an imaginative place, it's not a theater, uh, very nice and friendly, no, it's the real theater. So I wanted something real, not, uh, and the only way to be in the theater without being in the theater, the only way was using the virtual reality. So that's why we use that tool. Okay, perfect, thank you. And Mireya, what about you? You really build your company around VR. What was attractive for you in, in, with that technology? Well, um, a little bit like Teresa, right? Um, by the way, in, impressive. Uh, I love this project with Nixie for Children. Congratulations. Um, it's, it's a little bit the same, actually. I, in my case, it was more because of uh, uh, my personal necessity. Uh, well, I have two little girls. Uh, one of them started having some problems, so I, we we went to the doctor many times. No, and were in in the hospital a bit long, and then I I noticed no how tough it was for the little girl to you know have the IV roots and and check again and and she was crying and and we had to hold her almost like you know, making her do it, even if she didn't want it. And, and I thought there had to be something to do about this moment, you know, this, this um, painful moment for them, this trauma, traumatic moment, no, almost for the little kids of, of an IB, IB insertion or a blood exam. So I started looking around, I, I found VR and, and then I figured out why not doing this because I didn't find something specific for that at that moment. And that's where VR Pharma appeared. No, um, I, I basically saw how you know powerful the technology is, how immersive it is, how positively you can create a sense of presence and connect your body with your heart and mind. And and then from here you have so many opportunities. Um, we are basically now 
a distraction and a well-being tool, right? But from here, we can go to many places. I mean, uh, Rafael just showed us the incredible technology. Uh, the technology is being, you know, the quality is increasing so much. The price is going lower, so it's more accessible. You can find it easy. You can have it home. You can find it in the hospital. So yeah, I thought for for me it was it was this, no, this this um, presence, this immersion, this embodiment that it allows you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Mireya. And Jose, so I think that that's great that now we are finally using like digital tools like AR VR for education. So why why did you go for that? And what are what are benefits for for the the students? Uh, well, the answer is, is very easy to understand. The pandemic. <laughs> we uh, are working, the pandemic really, the COVID, we are working for a lot of years in training programs in the kidney disease world. Um, I'm uh, a full-time, uh, Rafael, uh, full-time employees, and I worked a lot of years ago in education, okay? In training programs in all related with uh, kidney diseases and mainly related with dialysis. And we make national international courses and so on. And with the pandemic, or oh, stop it. And we have to go online. But how? We have a lot of experience with key uh, opinion leaders in vascular soil, in the vascular procedures, and so on and so on. And we have a lot of courses that people came to our hospital to be trained. And then what are we going to do if they are at home? We have a problem. Then uh, we, have, uh, we have a research group inside of the Research and Innovation Institution, Institution uh, Institute of the part of Lee Hospital. And we work with, we have a team with uh, clinicians, also biomedical engineers, and so on. And the question is why not translate all that we make with synthetic models, because we, we use the medical imaging to transfer it with uh, imaging language to our synthetic models, because our synthetic models have the same imaging you have in your body inside the, our models, the same veins, uh, arteries, and so on. And then the question, as we have the tools, why not do the same in virtual reality? Then we have uh, we have a consortium with different companies, and then we involve the uh, company that work in uh, virtual reality to transfer our all our knowledge for clinicians and for biomedical engineering inside the virtual reality. And we made that we are, we are very young. It's not like Rafael because Rafael, you are you are really amazing that you you have spent us before. But I have the feeling that all that we made previously in the other language for synthetic bodies we transfer in question of weeks to real virtuality. Because if you know what are you doing with your hands, if you have the, 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 the knowledge in your mind, and you have the tools of the medical engineering, all you are doing is the models you can transfer to better reality. Because better reality is a software that they only have to understand is that you want to transfer to them. The conclusion is that. In fact, we have introduced that in, in the course that we are holding just now these days. I come from, from these courses. We are going to have another course for the European Congress but the European meeting of nephrology in the, in the online, the European meeting of the vascular society also online, and we're introducing that immediately. In fact, in the Spanish meeting of the vascular society, uh, we introduced our experience in the meeting, and if we have we have a huge problem because the Spanish meeting of vascular access have our, around 300 people. Well, uh, from one day to other one came uh, online. Then the possible people that was going to come to the workshops came from 180 for the next year, for the previous year, to zero. We introduced the virtual reality in the propaganda, 200 people. Amazing. We have made this in our courses. The course that we're doing today is a course for only 30 people. It was 30 people in January. The pandemic doesn't go. Zero people. Social media virtual reality, 30 people, full. The people is now in the room training with, with virtual reality. It's really amazing. The only thing that you need is the knowledge, the knowledge of Mireya, the knowledge of Teresa, the knowledge of people, Rafael, and you put this with the language of virtual reality, and you got it. This is the idea. <laughs> Rafael, so you showed people like different, uh, right? different AR, VR, MX tools. How do you choose like someone who wants to, to use those tools? There's so many of them, like, how do you choose one? Well, I think that the, the first thing is that you gotta you gotta uh, choose uh, what what the problem is, right? Why are you trying to what are you trying to tackle, right? It, it depends on 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 the level of immersion that you would need. I think that uh, 
uh, when you think about uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and mixed reality, that sometimes augmented and mixed reality are, are confused a little bit because they're not simple concepts to understand. But, but basically, augmented reality uh, superimposes the digital over the physical, right? But in uh, mixed reality, you now have both the physical and the digital interacting, and you have a mapping of the real world, and you can have a photo volumetric avatar of a, of a patient, all digital, sitting in a real chair in the real world. So uh, if you are thinking education and uh, you need to uh, train someone and immerse someone in an experience, it makes sense to use VR. So VR is certainly much more accessible, right? You have a device uh, like, like this, right, uh, uh, that uh, uses, you know, obviously, you know, the, the smartphone inside, but you use the power of this computer that we already own with a device that it's basically free and uh, you can do virtual reality with fully digitally computer generated content or you can use 360 degree video or, or pictures or, or 180 degree video if you want and you can mix the two. It's certainly a more affordable, it's more a, a, a accessible, it's a easier, a, like a, a Teresa and, and, and Mireille were saying, you, 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 patients immediately get it we, uh, you know, kids now, or you, young people, even adults and older people, they're all immersed in, in technologies in, in 2D, right, uh, through screens. Uh, and so it's very, very easy to transition. Now, when you uh, have an experience that is a little bit more complex and you don't need the full immersion, and maybe you need the interaction with the physical world, be it a, a patient, a neck, a EMR, you know, electronic medical record image or radiologic image or an ultrasound, uh, then you can think about using a AR or using a mixed reality. There's a company in Australia called GIGXR, which uh, a, a GIGXR. They basically create photovolumetric uh, patient scenarios, real patients. They are digitalized, and you can bring those patients. I've, I've used that with my students in the OR, and you put a patient in the in the in the stretcher and the patient goes from being healthy to having a severe a respiratory distress, a, a, a clinical picture a, from COVID. So you can have these students learn about this with real pain in a photovolumetric a rendering using an AR device, which could be your the AR power of your phone or your tablet, or it could be an expensive HoloLens or Magic Leap or View6 device. But then you can bring the student who could be at home, you know, thousands of miles or kilometers away in the pandemic, and you can still teach them about the different aspects of clinical medicine by using the power, uh, using the power of technology. So it really, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, I hate to see when I see VR is dead or AR is the future. They're all different and they're all different tools in the same armamentarium. And like Teresa was saying, they're not substitutes. It, this is just another tool to empower the human to be a better human doctor. Fantastic. Absolutely. And maybe I would like to come back to uh, uh, something that uh, Jose was saying before, the fact that COVID-19, the, the, the pandemic actually pushed the use of, of VR in their case. And, and it's true that all of us being in, in digital health, um, we've seen the, the, the pandemic as a, as a catalyzer, like pushing digitalization of healthcare. So the, the others, like, was it the same for you? Did you think that... Um, COVID-19 helped you to, to push maybe Maria the adoption of your solution. Uh, Teresa Rafael in your hospital, like was it used more, more widely with patient as well? Well, in my hospital, you see the the uh, the uh, in the hospital the. Uh, I wish my hospital was more visionary and more innovative. You know, a lot of the stuff I do in the hospital is with students or patients like on my own in the clinic, but clinically it's very hard to integrate any of these technologies. So, but many other hospitals around the world, because of the pandemic, we have seen that a telehealth, which we had had around for decades. Now telehealth suddenly in a matter of days was the way to connect with patients and to, to connect with provider to provider. You have seen technologies like Proximi AR, for example, that bring the expert remotely to the less expert a, a surgeon anywhere in the world. And you can bring the AR hand of that expert surgeon anywhere in the world with low technology. All you need is a camera and a, and a computer screen and their software, even with low bandwidth. So that have exploded during the pandemic. You can bring 5,000 students to one OR, 
Students could be medical students or residents or less uh, uh, experienced surgeons. So because of the pandemic, everything like that, any remote connectivity using technology has been exponentially pushed because of the pandemic. And well, I, I think, think the pandemic has, has done a lot of things in our heads, especially doctors uh, are absolutely immersed during the pandemic with COVID-19 and we are still working with this 19 COVID, the f well, I don't want to say about work. Okay, but uh, the problem is that we are still in dynamic time. We are in the third wave and waiting for, unfortunately, the fourth wave. So. Uh, we are hoping to have to go back to uh, what we used to say the normality one day i don't know when uh, but mm -hmm. i hope soon but along the, all, the whole this time the um, telehealth is what has changed dramatically so because uh, during the first wave we were absolutely all the doctors nurses etc uh, we were absolutely immersed with patients COVID-19 so we didn't think about other things only the emergence really emergence patients since the second wave when we started to go back to treat the, the rest of the patient more not only COVID-19 so the problem had that we don't want to get so many people inside the hospital. So the only way uh, to find, to think about something is talking about by phone, using the video call, etc. And in this area is where I think has really catalyzed all these, our minds to think about how to, this is changing now, but it's gonna change when we go back to the normality, because we've seen that this is it's feasible and it's really comfortable even for the patient because they don't need to come to a hospital they don't want to come so it's quite easy if you can can the, the over the the information uh, sending home or only instead of going to see the surgeon the nurse the anesthesiologist maybe with only one visit to the hospital they can get all the information and then go back and study home and only I, if i call them then they have the few questions after using virtual reality this is for one hand and on the other hand we find uh, the way to teach our trainees that's i think the um, all the simulators that has been using for a long time they are now are the, especially in anesthesiology i don't know in other areas probably in surgery much more than us but we are creating these scenarios uh, where we are working for a long time with trainees because they are real situations uh, like virtual reality so and they are using much more these other tools that Raphael has this factory with him in the <laughs> in the office and they are really useful because trainees they feel in this area they are managing difficult situations really stressful situations and they learn a lot without putting in danger the patients and in these two points i think this is the most important point the top point for me for the digital technologies that we are going to use it much more than now in the new normality, I think, because uh, the new technologies that has come or the new ways of treating patients, I think the, because of the COVID-19, um, they have changed absolutely the way we are working, but in a good way in some time. So, so things that have to come and to stay for a long time, I think. Fantastic. Mireya, what about you? Yeah, I, I agree with with everything said. Um, it is true that now we have seen, you know, patients being even more vulnerable sometimes because of the COVID-19. Um, you know, they might be in the hospital for weeks, uh, not being able to receive any visits. Even for mm -hmm. children, they only can be with one or their parents at a time. Maybe the sister or the brother cannot go, you know, so... Yeah. You you have this problem, and then you also have the the stress of of the you know the medical staff. So I think that the BR is giving now also um, a tool to get out from the hospital to be able to walk away from that situation for an instant, no, and maybe even decrease your anxiety, decrease the level of of the stress that you know um, nurses and doctors are having right now 
we are actually doing a pilot around this and, and it is true that we can see uh, a decrease by using VR uh, as a you know daily therapy. And, and I think these tools, so telemedicine, VR, IR, um, you know, VR medicine are here to stay, um, as Teresa and Rafael said, mm -hmm. and that they can bring us many, many, many ways of improvement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I will so, take a uh, question from the, from the audience. So Silvia would like to ask a question to Teresa. Have you considered mm -hmm. creating in your virtual reality room where this patient experience would be projected? Sorry, sorry. I, I have can't you hear you. Have you considered creating a virtual reality room where the patient no. experience would be projected? No, 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 no. No, because this wasn't the main idea. The main idea is they. Uh, I want them to know exactly where they are going to be. I don't want an imaginary theater. I want the real one. So we choose one and we only use the virtual reality for the patient that's going to be to this theater. Then you can, uh, exactly what you can do is to have one video, one tour, the virtual reality of each theater. That's true. But no, I don't want to create one. This is already done. But I okay. truly believe that the right thing is to know exactly where they're going to be. Because then they, just at the moment they get inside, they see, well, I know that these are the lies, this is snakes, this is the face mask that, that, that the snakes told me, etc. Okay. So we have another question that's uh, a bit also related. So that's from um, Dr. Stuborn on you asking, so there are several companies uh, proposing the use of VR for children in preoperative situations for needle anxiety and for procedures. How long before VR becomes common in those cases? What well, um, this is something actually we're working in VR Pharma is one of our main uh, targets. Uh, you know, the, the IV routes and, and all the procedures before the operation, the, the surgery. And it works very good. It works very good. We, we are halfway in our trial now. And I cannot share results because they are not published yet, but it, it is proving that you know, the anxiety, the pain perception uh, from the kids, from the children is decreasing. And also they feel calmer, they feel more relaxed, they feel more comfortable. Uh, they do not see the needle. Uh, so yeah, in a way it is also easier for the nurse to to put the needle uh, faster, probably only with one trial they, they can do it already. And also the family uh, shows a high satisfaction rate. No, So I think that for this uh, particular usage, uh, BR in kids, in children from three, four, five years old and older, it's, it's a very good uh, use and and well, it, it is it is true that it's not easy maybe to enter a, a hospital. Sometimes there is a problem of um, how to find the budget for these uh, technologies. No, maybe because it's not a medicine, but it's a it's a tool to enhance well-being. Sometimes uh, they do not have a budget defined for these kind of innovations and these kind of technologies. So yeah, there is a bit of a you know. Some, sometimes it, it's a bit slow to enter the hospital, but, but they, they see the usage and they see how good it can do. So, yeah, okay. at least it it's here in Spain. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe a similar question for Rafael and, and Jose, like apply to, to you to the operating room and to medical education. When can we hope to see every surgeon operating with uh, VR, AR, AR, MX glasses, no? Or like all the students using those technologies to learn? What do you think? Jose, do you want to start? Um, well, from the training point of view, um, I think that all is a question of price, probably. Because um, uh, the capacity of virtual reality to uh, develop anything that you think that you can do in medicine is incredible so the only thing that you need is um, a question of resources 
as now the different glasses and different software perhaps have became cheap, probably this is going to, to, to came uh, earlier than we think. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really a beginner. I have a lot of experience in simulation models, but I'm beginning in virtual reality. My, the comparison of the courses uh, uh, here now uh, in Spain, I think probably I'm a pioneer in this aspect in the clinic world. Uh, I think that is really incredible because I'm hearing in the students that they, they say, this is the first time that I understand how, how it works, this, this, this. Now, this is the first time I understand finally this after a lot of courses. Only with 10 minutes. Really incredible. Uh, I really, I think uh, I, that uh, in any course that we create of this, the speed of increasing the capacity of giving knowledge is crucial. In fact, the courses that I'm doing with this for the last months are really not very expensive. Even is more expensive, really, the platform of the course than the reality security process. It's not very expensive, really. The really expensive is the time that you need to create the anatomy, the structure, so on. This is time. This is a lot of time. But really, the resources are not really. So this is a question probably of months. In question, the one or two years, probably. And this is this is have come to be with us forever. Because when the face-to-face -face courses came again, we are going to maintain the real virtuality. And the, the pity of the pandemic really is the networking because you lose the contact face to face with the people. This is a pity really. But when you recover the real courses, we're going to maintain the networking processes, but they're all related with the virtual reality. You're going to, it's, it's the same like the Google Maps. Do you think you can live without Google Maps? <laughs> no? It's the same. Actually. When you walk, it's the same. The virtual reality is the same that any kind of procedure, procedure any kind of, proce of, of process in your domestic life that you want to miss. I lose my mobile and I think that I have an ictus. <laughs> then this is the thing probably with the virtual reality in education in only one year, I think. But this is from my humble point of view. Probably I would like to hear the, 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 the opinion of Rafael because you are a you are a you are a re, I think that you are a, a reference in this area and probably you can explain us how is the synergy process of the learning process of this kind of, uh, of, of techniques. No, uh, Jose, I think uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with you. I, I, I really, um, you see, the, I think there, there, there are different aspects, right, to, to consider. I think that, that pandemic or no pandemic, the pandemic has accelerated everything, but it was going to happen anyways in regards to virtual reality and, and augmented mixed reality, I think. Uh, I think that point of view of, of uh, the devices, right, the devices are exponentially coming better, faster, smaller, cheaper, more user friendly to the point where Facebook, you know, is coming with glasses. You have Apple coming with glasses very soon. You have Google coming with a glass. So it's going to be like a smartphone. It's going to be everywhere. And then uh, let's uh, if you if you forget a little bit about healthcare and education, everything else in life, I think retail, travel, e commerce, banking, everything, you know, the the the, the immer let's call it immersive technologies, AR, VR, MR, they're all gonna be part of the another tool in the process of of communicating and connecting. So now back to healthcare and education. I would say that within I, I dare to say that within the, the next um, three years we're gonna have a standard a, a, a use of immersive technologies in any medical curriculum, at least in in countries that are of uh, higher income, right? Uh, you know, we don't call them uh, developing or or, or, or uh, underdeveloped or third world countries. In pay, in countries of low income, I think that that's still going to be a little struggle, but not for too long, because connectivity is improving. You're going to have you know, Wi-Fi universally very soon. Uh, you have projects like uh, Starlink with the uh, satellites uh, all over the place. There are hundreds out there already. You have 5G coming, and even faster than 5G. You know, you talk about uh, a, 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 you know 6G already. So it, the connectivity infrastructure is going to be better. The devices are going to improve. They're going to become daily use for your domestic life, like Jose was saying. And uh, it, it, you won't be able to train someone as fast as well and as inexpensively with the regular traditional tools than with VR or AR. And uh, it's not like you're only gonna do it with VR and AR, they're gonna be tools. You're still gonna need probably a cadaver at some point, at least for a long time, and you're gonna need to do some clinical training. You know, once you are an expert in simulated scenarios, you're gonna bring 
you know, just like the pilots, you know, doing the, 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 the flying simulators. Uh, but I think that within five years for education and for diagnostics, actually for three years, and I think that for therapeutics, I would say three to five years because, you know, to have the, the millimetric precision of putting something in someone's body, you need to have, and that is already happening, it's already happening slowly, but happening with clinical patients. Like I talked about brain lab and magic leap interaction, you know, the mixed reality viewer, it is already being used. So it, we are gonna be there and it's very a, much a matter of time for everyone to realize that you either do it now and you invest on that and have the vision or you fall behind every competitor. So uh, it, it is very exciting because I think that before we retire, you know, uh, uh, all of us, I think we're gonna see a, a, a very, very big push in this being a traditional standard tool in, in healthcare a, 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 a for a healthcare training a, and for a diagnostics and a therapeutics. I'm already a, working, a, for example, a quickly, a colleague of mine and myself are designing a, an online a course on virtual reality, augmented and mixed reality a training for healthcare providers, all online for Northeastern University in Boston. Imagine that, you go there, you log in the computer and they teach you everything you need to know about this topic in a, in a, in a course that, that is also gonna be online. So you can take it even during the pandemic. And then when you get to your places, you start thinking, you know, how do I innovate? How do I catch up with, with, the, with the rest of the world about bringing these technologies to my place, to my patients, to my students, to my colleagues? I think it's very exciting. Where can we access that course? Is it on your website? Is there more information there? No, not yet. We are still creating the content. We're creating the curriculum. They think that by the end of the spring of this year, it's going to be live in the Northeastern University website. It's probably going to be part of their curriculum. So who knows how, but, but you know, that's just the beginning. Every university is, as they had, you know, MOOCs, you know, the MOOCs back then, and now they have digital virtual content and you go and you can take classes in Harvard or MIT or La Sorbonne or, or uh, you know, in, 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 in the best universities in Spain, in Europe and in the world, then you are going to be able to do it online. Uh, and I think that that's, that's the future. That's fantastic. That's very inspiring, actually. Yeah. So now, as a as a conclusion, I will ask you each one of you very very quickly, very short sentence. Uh, your takeaway from from the session today, like what are you excited about, like VR, AR, MR for for the coming month and, and years? Mireya, do you want to start very quickly? Okay. Um... Well, I think that what I take from here is the amount of uh, possibilities and opportunity that VR and AR is leading to in, in all the fields and in the medical field. Um, you know, the capability of shutting off the overthinking mind, the capability of creating um, internal roots in between the mind, the body, the heart, uh, recalibrate your mind, recalibrate uh, your perception, the feelings, the fears, anxiety. Well, I think it's incredible. I think there are many, many, many opportunities and a lot of things still have to be done. And yeah, I think this is here to stay. Fantastic. Teresa, your takeaways? Yes, well, summarizing new technology are here to come and to stay as a tool to help us, never to replace us. I'm so sorry. I know that the surgeon love all these devices because they love them, but I think they can replace it. Still, they can replace their minds, thankfully. Uh, but I think this is going to help us not only to treat in patient for the telemedicine and especially in education, both of the simulation. I think they are really important and they're going to be here to stay. Um, the, we're still working in the health service program. The budgets are still really short and we need to improve them and to teach all the head managers that uh, the really the, the balance is good in favor to these new technologies very important very important jose yeah. your takeaway uh, yes i will summarize all of this with only one word this is the future world of matrix <laughs> <laughs> beyond the world <laughs> <laughs> I have the feeling in a few months that anything you touch in medicine, I will feel at least, 
can become in a parallel world. Uh, I, I work with these, <laughs> with these people. And do you know the feeling of put the glasses and another guy with the glasses in another hospital, other the glasses in, in, in your home, and you are in the same room, walking, speaking, and making procedures? But you are in your home, your hospital. Be careful with your furniture or the table. You can, you can break your head. And you can make working in a virtual reality world and do the same procedures with your hands, with touching anything. This is Matrix. This is a revolution. <laughs> I, I would like to, I, I, but I, I wait in the, the opinion, because for me is the more important one by your experience of Rafael in this world, because I'm, I'm, I'm a beginner I told you before, and, uh, and uh, because I have the feeling that this is going with so much speed that with the knowledge that all the things that we have in our contest or the people like company like Mireya, people like uh, like like Teresa, that if we have the infrastructure to work with uh, with our knowledge, this uh, this can go with a huge speed. Yeah, fantastic, Rafael. Last word. <laughs> No, th th thank you for, to you and your team for, for organizing this and for allowing us to, to, to really share our, our insights. It's really great to meet to meet all of you. And uh, I, I tell you, my, my takeaway is, uh, you know, the, the, there's so much happening all over the world uh, so fastly, like uh, Jose was saying. You know, I, I didn't know about uh, VR Pharma. I didn't know about Nixies. I didn't know about Anais. <laughs> and I think that I'm on top of things, right? So everywhere in the world, figure, things are happening. You know, we are all about uh, putting... A, a, a patients first, about putting patients and relatives experience yeah. first, and about using the technology in a smart way to make us a better communicators, better connectors, and to give the patient a better a, a experience at the same time, enhancing the humanity in medicine. You see, see VR Pharma, a, 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 a Mireya, a, you know, you don't want to see the kids suffer or the mother or the father suffering, you know, when they're getting their experience. You see, a, you know, a Teresa, you know, the, the, the kids are having a better, you know, a perioperative anxiety experience. A, a, you know, the, the, the errors maybe are diminishing because of the way Jose is training the students. You know, I think that all of this is about improving the experience. And, and uh, you know, my, my takeaway is, you know, there's such a great network out there that we need to reach out to and combine all our heads and not try to reinvent the wheel because we're all doing it and putting no. our little grains of sand and it's all ready there. We, we're all going very, very far if we go together, I think. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So we came to the end of part one. Part two is going on on Clubhouse. Uh, in, in five minutes, uh, Raphael will be there. Other other experts um, in pharma he should be there. Other companies that are doing great projects. Uh, so the link is in is in the chat. And so now uh, the next um, BHH series will be held on the 24th of March, and we will talk okay. about English the medical device uh, regulations. This is very important for startups because mm. it's really, uh, maybe you would need to, to be to need to qualify as medical device. So um, Aspani and the company will give you a workshop on MDR. Um, so it will be more of an of a ed educational session this time. So it's really, really worth it. So 24th of March and, and we'll send some information on our website. So thank you everybody for yeah. coming. Thank you to all the speakers okay. for your great insight, your presentations. And see okay. you in five minutes on Clubhouse okay. and see you for the next PHH series. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. You Thank, too. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.